Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alderman History Podcast. I'm joined today by, I'm proud to say, the newest member of the A Fork in Time and Rimward Happen team. That's Dylan Holzimer. Dylan has been on a couple of episodes with us, and we we liked him so much and thought that he brought so much to the table that we didn't make him wait the normal waiting period. He's going to Cooperstown without having to wait five years, is what one of my colleagues said to me. So, uh, Dylan, I'm excited about you joining the team, uh, the perspectives that you bring, and uh so, hey, thanks for being on with me today. Thanks for joining the team. And as I mentioned to you, we were setting this up. I thought a good thing to do, we had a chance to visit off podcast a good bit around some of our recordings and just let our listeners know who you are a little bit more and get introduced to you so that when they hear you, you're not just a voice bringing insight, but they know a little bit about your background and who you are and they can put, put the bigger picture together. So Dylan, welcome formally to the team and welcome to our episode today. Thank you, Don. It's an honor. It's a, a pleasure to be expedited, I guess is the word. I, I uh I feel like I've been fast tracked. I'm important. I feel like a politician. <laughs> yeah, but, but by the way, and you didn't have to do what you normally have to have happen. You know, with, with my thinking about that with MLB, you normally have to die for them to skip the uh, the five year waiting period. So, so <laughs> you, you're alive and you get to do it even better. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, it's it's just an honor. First off, I uh, I want to thank you for getting me through basically a year and a half, two years of the pandemic, listening basically continuously to the back catalog. So that was really kind of where I started um, between that and Harry Turtle Dove, you know, a lot of how everybody else kind of gets into alternate history. But you guys got me through a solid two years of uh, desk work in the pandemic and kept things entertaining. So I want to thank you and the rest of the team for doing what you guys do for everybody out there and making things a little more bearable. I appreciate that, Dylan. And uh, as I've, I've said multiple times on the podcast, the the great benefit that I didn't think we would we would derive when Alexis and I had talked about it, and then I finally just thrust it upon her and started it. And it's like, okay, now we've done this. Now we're committed to it. Uh, there in in 2019, as I had no idea what was looming nine months down the road and how that was going to change things, and to hear your story, you know actually you know, touches me a little bit to know, you know, that you know, we, we were there and, and doing something positive beyond just doing what we love to do and, and have fun and talk, but also doing the podcast during that period of time brought a level of sanity to me too, because I was working from home and, and, you know, not interacting with the world a lot. And so even though it's a one-way medium, you know, in so many ways, I felt like, okay, at, le- at least I'm doing something different here. This is a nice distraction. And I would get the feedback from, you know, folks that we were meeting or for episode feedback, or whatever it was. Okay. People are listening. So this is worth doing. And it was a, it was a, a, a I had one-way dialogue connection to the real world, if that made any sense as we were going through that. And, uh, so I sort of feel the same way. I, but I knew it was coming and that we, that we would all need that. Yeah, it's uh, you you saved me from, uh, I, know, I know the feeling of talking to oneself because I, uh, I was uh, for, this is kind of a long story short, but I was basically in charge of running in an entire department at work uh, as a department of one. So I became a little more comfortable talking to myself than uh, most people probably should be just to pass the time. So uh, being able to uh, know that somebody else knows the feeling is uh, it's, it's a nice change. Yeah, cool. So I appreciate those kind words and I appreciate uh, how we got connected and then, and, and you being active and engaged. In episode. So, you know, you decide what to share here. Tell folks a little bit about your background, you know, what, what you do during the day. I, I, I know that that's, you know, as you've described yourself, you're a dirt attorney is how you, how you described it to me once. So I know it's, it's real estate law, but uh, you know, what else? And of course, I know you have some interesting sort of hobbies and, and side things that, you know, we sort of brought to the Elvis episode and some of the other things there. So just, if you're going to give the elevator speech and assume you're going up to a really tall building, like in Abu Dhabi, <laughs> what would you tell people about Dylan? So um, let's see here. Uh, born and raised Memphian. I am the son of two teachers. Uh, my dad was a hist- high school history and English teacher for 30, 35 years. So that kind of started the interest in history and sort of 
you know, the possibilities of history and things like that, he was very much sort of in the veins of the American West military history because he had been drafted and his his dad was in the Navy in World War II. I kind of came in and went to college and originally thought I was going to be a teacher and decided to get a history degree because, well, I was already good at it. I didn't have to study. I basically didn't have to go to class and I could write most of my papers about three hours before they were due the night before, as one does in college. Um, so it seemed like the uh, the perfect fit. I ended up in college going more kind of towards the classics. I know from from some of our back and forth, we've tossed some ideas about like I'm I tend to be more of the ancient and sort of medieval period, although I do like a lot of the the kind of American West sort of area in the 1800s. But I quickly realized um, I had enough teachers in my family. There's my parents and then one of my aunts are also a teacher. So we were getting recognized enough at grocery stores and various places around town for that. I figured the family needed a little bit of variety. So I decided uh, I was lucky enough to be able to get into law school, went to do that. Um, Originally, um, while I was in college and actually in law school, I decided to be a tour guide. So I actually was down on Beale Street giving people tours and things like that. It was it was the perfect college gig. And I got to talk a lot about Memphis history, which is sort of what led me to knowing a lot about Elvis when we did the Graceland episode. And then in law school, it was perfect because I could study, I could learn about torts and contracts and real estate, and then go play guitar and give a tour for two, three hours, and then come right back. It was basically stress relief that I got paid for, which was yeah. the most wonderful way to get through law school. Um, but that's kind of how I started. And originally, I actually wanted to be an entertainment lawyer because of the sort of musical connection and things like that. You can't see it, but I've got a an amp and a, like a rack of four or five guitars in the back. It's getting excessive. Um But then I, long story short, I kind of stumbled into real estate. I did closings for a year or so, just kind of the first um, job that I took after after law school. You just sort of, uh, for any lawyers who are listening, you you know full well, you become an expert in whatever people will hire you to do, not necessarily what you want. And then uh, I was lucky enough to stumble into uh, the current job that I have, which as one attorney explained to me. When I told him basically what I do, he said, I didn't know that was such a thing, but now I kind of want that job. So the short version of what I do now is I am a non-practicing real estate attorney who works in the courthouse. Um, The county does delinquent property tax foreclosures when people don't pay their property taxes. Um, Obviously, especially in a state like Tennessee, those of you who understand sort of the economic demographics of of sort of the U.S. and the various states. Tennessee is very property tax heavy state. Um, Most of our revenues from that, especially on the county level. And there are uh, quite a bit of properties in Shelby County, not to get too much into it, but because of the socioeconomic status of the city, there are unfortunately a lot of people who are delinquent on taxes. And so I help the county do that stuff to sort of recoup property tax revenue. So basically, I am a non-practicing dirt lawyer who works in the courthouse because I figured the best way to avoid going to court was to work there. There you go. <laughs> you, you can walk by it, but you don't have you don't have to dark. You don't have to actually go in it. it makes exactly. Perfect. Exactly. Yeah, I, I've told you know told my backstory a lot of times on the podcast and the others. You know, I, I at one point was going to go to law school, was smart enough to work for an attorney when I was an undergraduate, and although you know. Depending on, again, like you said, whatever you may have worked on, may have had a different interest. But I quickly realized I don't want to do this, but I'm too far along with a political science degree. So what am I going to do? So, you know, it makes perfect sense that I that I sell things for a living and talk for a living. But um, it's, it's you know, like you said, it's I, I enjoy what I do. I've enjoyed what I've learned over now 30 years of doing consultative selling. And uh, it, it's interesting to me, you know, like, like a lot of degrees, be it history or be it, be it political science, you know, quote unquote, liberal arts types of degrees. Uh, are a good basis for almost anything you do. You know, I think they're they're. I, I would encourage more people to get a more generalized education, and then obviously get the education you need to be specialized in whatever you're doing, because that general education will pay off for you at some point, uh, whether you even realize how it's going to be there or not. So you mentioned your love of history. You told me a great story. I, this we may have talked about this on air. I don't want to hear it again. You had a you your family had a brush with greatness with one of the my favorite historians that would be Civil War historian Shelby Foote. Yes, so um, Shelby Foote. For those of you who may not know, um, especially some of the international listeners, Shelby Foote was this sort of historic, you know, sort of once in a generation historian in terms of how important this one series of books that he did became. He is the guy who did. The Civil War, a narrative, this sort of magnum 
opus three-part series of the history of the Civil War done in kind of a narrative style. It was hugely influential on, you know, Ken Burns. I think it was yeah. the the most cited thing for his Civil War documentary by, you know, you know, above and beyond everything else. Um, you know, Shelby Foote's just this this seminal historian of sort of the American Civil War period. He used to he he was lived in Memphis the whole time he was writing those books. And he Memphis was his uh, home base when he was doing that. And my dad, among other things that he did, he would coach high school soccer. So he would take his soccer kids out to Overton Park, which is this big park in the center of the city that's actually got its own historical kind of importance. It's Supreme Court precedent. I don't want to get too lawyerly nerdy, but that's a whole nother fun story. But basically, it's this big, beautiful park in the center of the city, and he would go have his kids play soccer there. And he would periodically see, you know, my dad being a history teacher, he knew who Shelby Foote was. He would see Shelby Foote sitting on a park bench, just sitting there daydreaming while he was, you know, working on something or other, a manuscript, thinking about what he was going to write. And so one day he's he's got his kids playing soccer in this big greensward area. It's this big open field. And Shelby Foote just starts walking. He goes straight from his park bench. He's off daydreaming. He's not looking where he's going. He's just wandering straight through <laughs> the soccer practice. My dad's trying to wave kids so that they don't hit him in the freaking head with a soccer ball. <laughs> and he just wanders through. He's not paying attention. He just kind of keeps going. And he just sits down on another park bench. And that was that. <laughs> uh, what just flashed through my head, Dylan, was uh, the headline that could have been, you know, re renowned Civil War story. Renowned Civil War historian Shelby Foote died today as a result of a soccer ball <laughs> hitting him in the head in Memphis. You know, film at yeah. eleven kind of thing. That would have been a whole different, whole different story. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that that could have been bad, but no. Fortunately, no soccer balls. We we were safe. Shelby Foote went on to publish all of his good stuff. Yeah. So it's you know one of the things that I like particularly about living in Memphis and a lot of you know other sort of medium sized cities like that is. You you kind of have all these connections that sort of tie people together. You know, you'll hear stories around here of people is, of a certain age sitting at a, a red light and running into Elvis in a Cadillac, pulling yeah. up right next to him and just chit chatting through the window in the seventies as they're just driving around town. So it's just kind of one of those things. It's interesting to see how you know the connections between people can sort of pop up where you don't expect. Yeah, yeah, and it's easy to see where you got your love of history fun. Obviously, it, it's somewhat genetic. It's also somewhat the setting and the surroundings that are there. And uh, one of the things we've talked about, you know, we, we talk about a lot of things, then eventually get around to doing them. Is you know, one of the things we want to go more frequently with a fork in time in the room where it happened is further back into that period that that's, that, that you like further back into history. You know, it's easy to get trapped in the. Alexis has an idea about something in you know British history, which goes back for a while, but doesn't go back to the other way, or for us to get trapped in a lot of things that are a little bit more you know modern for our listeners. But one of the things we've talked about is you know rumor had happened where the room might be where the Senate met met at a couple of different places when it was the Roman Senate, and then you know working off some of the things that go there because I do find that era of history fascinating, and that era of history is so um, influential on you know western culture and, and what we are today you know be it be it law be it politics be it you know thought whatever the case might be so and i know we've talked about that we'll eventually get around to doing it as, as we're rolling forward here so your other i want to talk a little bit about the musical thing there so you play obviously was what and you may have mentioned this earlier was that a family thing as well or did you pick that up separately uh, yes. Yeah, that was a family thing. My dad picked it up uh, when he was in college. And so I kind of always had guitars around the house. You know, I used to when I was a kid, just sort of, you know, kind of how little kids do. They sort of bang on everything to figure out what sounds good and what doesn't. So I would just kind of whack the guitar strings, um, just making noise, really. But, you know, eventually I kind of picked it up from watching him do it. Um, it came in handy because at the tour company that I worked at, we would actually do musical tours where you would actually play the songs oh, cool. of Memphis as you were driving around. We had this whole rigged up bus with a, a mic and a PA system, and you would actually play, you know, Stax tunes, Otis Redding, Elvis, Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee, as we were driving around pointing to all this stuff. So it was really kind of a fun thing. And then it's it turned into just sort of a good way to kind of relieve stress, get a creative outlet, you know, get away from, you know, the studying and the stress of work and having to do that. And actually, I still... um I still play in a band with my dad and some of his college buddies. We have a blues band. We play not not super frequently. A lot of them are, are 
you know, getting on in years, um, you know, because they were in college in the late 60s and early 70s. But just it's a good way for us to get together and just sort of have fun and play. Yeah. And it, it's a fun thing to to share across generations, I'm sure, as yeah. well. Uh, I'm sure you have that with your dad. How many times you and your dad probably talk history stuff is probably more than you oh, can yeah. count and probably still do. But it's nice to have a different topic to go to outside of that as well. Yeah. And, and music, mu- you know, music, music is history. That's, you know, to me, that's one of the interesting things you were talking about, the uh, Ken Burns Civil War um documentary which i still hold up there as being one of the best that's ever been made particularly if you you like the topic that's being there but you know one of the things that he melded welded and melded through there were the interviews with folks like shelby foot where he became a public superstar he was already yeah. a, a superstar in the history but just because of you know his ability to tell a story he's a, he's a great narrator of, of stories and making them relevant but you know one of the things that burns did inside of that was incorporate musical motifs in such a way that they became you know like like opera or modern musical you know, certain motifs sort of represented certain things. And you didn't even realize that that was being done in your head while it was being done to you. That's how skillfully done it was. And uh, yes, I appreciate that as well. So again, Dylan, I am really excited about having you on the podcast on a regular basis. I know the other members of the team are. Uh, There was discussion behind the scenes about how you may offset the balance of power on the great barbecue debate, but that's, (laughs) that, 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 that's okay. We will eventually, uh, about the time that you get peace in the Middle East, we will solve the great barbecue. We will solve the great barbecue dilemma because they have about the same level of at least complexity, if not the same level of importance when it comes to <laughs> trying to get them solved. But there, there was there was concern among some of the, the quote unquote Texas faction about letting in another out of state person with a different take on barbecue. But that's that that, that will that will pop up, I'm sure, from time to time. But, because but Chris, Chris and Eric and Robert and others will make sure that it pops up from time to time because that's that's one of the things they like to talk about. We spend a lot of time off podcast. I'll just say this: we spend a lot of time off podcast talking about that. Probably more than I ever imagined that we would. I never thought I would have to defend Texas brisket as often as I do to uh, what my daughter was referred to. Those you mean you mean those you mean those foreigners that you have to defend Texas brisket to is how she once described it <laughs> on the side. So. Uh, I get it. Um, the other thing I, I thought we'd just do here really quick, because it, it sort of it ties back to the first episode you joined us for, and it's also a current event. We were uh, exchanging some messages, some text messaging back and forth, getting getting this set up just about Lisa Marie Presley's sort of sudden untimely death. And I'm just going to ask you here, just you know, this is a different form of the what if, but at least we get a what if into this so that we can officially call it an episode is that, you know, what does this potentially mean? I, I, maybe not so much for in, in, a, in a big sense, but Graceland is a big part of the Memphis economy, right? Yeah. So Graceland is still to this day, the number two visited house in the country, second only to the White House. It is one of the most visited tourist attractions of any kind. Um, And it's, it's kind of, it's interesting because, you know, most, most houses that you go visit for a historical sense, they're just like, you know, they're, they're a time capsule of their, their time and place, but they're like frozen in time. Whereas Graceland, especially with all the stuff they've done to it, is really not that. It is a whole holistic experience of sort of the the evolution of a whole period of music and not just sort of, oh yeah, here's these three years where Elvis liked to have plants in a room. I'm talking about the jungle room yeah. where he just went on the Hawaiian theme that's tacky in the sense of, oh, there's this was a stylistic choice from this very specific period in the mid 60s. But it becomes more of a motif that really ends up sort of standing in for a lot of Memphis. It is probably tourism is by far second, maybe only to logistics. They're kind of neck and neck. Right. Memphis is is primarily funded by two things: logistics, uh, obviously, because we've got FedEx, and tourism. You know, from Beale Street, from everything else, but especially for Graceland, and. In terms of the legal aspects of who's going to end up owning Graceland, you know, we can get into that. That's really going to stay in the family. But in terms of the financial aspects of what's going to happen now, honestly, I think that's going to be kind of the reckoning that's going to happen. I don't think much is going to change in terms of the sort of tourist experience of Graceland because all of that is run by Elvis Presley Enterprises, which is a separate legal entity. They spun the business aspect off of it years ago. Um, And although I think Lisa Marie and Priscilla 
I think Priscilla still has a seat on the board of Elvis Presley Enterprises and Lisa Marie, I think, did up until her death. They don't they weren't involved in the day to day decision making. They haven't been for probably 10 or 15 years now. Um, So Graceland as a business entity is going to stay the way it is. But I think Memphis is going to have to. I've, I've thought this for years, but I think especially now. Memphis is going to have to find a way to, as much as I hate to say it, wean itself off of its Elvis dependency. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too, how how this impacts that. Yeah. Yeah, because Graceland is kind of this, you know, monolithic sort of tourist presence in Memphis. You know, I think I joked about it when we went uh, either before the podcast or when we were talking on the, the Elvis episode we did. You know, Graceland for people in Memphis is like the place where you take your relatives when they're in town for Thanksgiving. That's really yeah. that's basically what it is. But it's such a huge pivotal part of our economy because you know, you you travel anywhere in the world. I've been to the UK, I've been to Spain, I've been to Italy, I've talked to people from all over the world. And the first thing you say when you say, Oh, I'm from Memphis, is they say Elvis and they say barbecue. You know, that's it. That's you're only known for two things. God help you for anything else. You're only known for two things if you come from Memphis. Um, and so it's it's this thing that has sort of gotten a life of its own, but that life you can kind of see has an expiration date. Yeah. That isn't known, but you can sort of see that it's coming. Because obviously the original fans of Elvis, just based on pure mathematics because of the time, they're already getting to the point where they can't really travel. So Graceland is going to start really very quickly running out of its primary financial system of support. And it's going to have to be relying on sort of second generation and independently created kind of rockabilly fans, you know, people who discover Elvis, but weren't around with Elvis. You know, there's, there's communities in like Scandinavia and Japan that have sort of these thriving. It's really kind of fascinating. If you've never seen them in big groups, there's these whole rockabilly, you know, communities of people that will come and you'll be looking at a bunch of Swedish people, you know, tall, skinny, blonde people with these big four or five inch pompadours and, you know, pink shirts and and fancy shoes. And they're just walking around and you're like, I don't, what did I time travel or something? But that's going to be what Graceland ends up having to rely on unless they can start figuring out some other way to do it. You know, it's hard to monetize a, a fixed location right? in an evolving way where you can sort of reinvent the place. You know, Graceland's been, been showing off things that, that had already been decades old for decades now. So I don't, it's going to be interesting. I feel bad for the city in terms of what it's going to have to go through, I think, to finally, find something else to be known for other than Elvis. I think quite frankly, we've been relying on it for too long. It's become kind of our crutch. Yeah. And, and, and it's time, it's time to diversify the whole bill street music experience, all the other things that are, are, yeah. are, 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 are historically great about Memphis, not just things yeah. that you would create moving forward, but, you know, covering it both ways. Yeah. yeah it makes, make, makes perfect sense to me. I was just curious to get your take on it. Cause again, when I heard the news, which was sort of shocking, uh, and and part of my, well, the reason I connect there, you know, I think I mentioned this on the other. I know I did on the episode. You know, my my parents. I, I grew up listening to Elvis because you know they listened to Elvis and the things that were there, and you know the the generation and the timing that I'm in. I'm I'm below that generation you described, but I was the kids of the generation yeah. that you described there, obviously. But you know, Lisa Marie, pretty close to me in age. So there's you know when you see somebody that's about your age who, you know, passes away suddenly and, you know, the stuff that had gone through there with, you know, the loss of a son. And we know some of you know, the addiction issues, which echo back to the things that we talked mm-hmm. about while, while we don't enjoy the, you know, well, we don't, we don't have new Elvis music today uh, because, because he's gone, gone, gone too soon is um, I started thinking through, you know, what does this mean? Because I, I went to Graceland as a fairly young adult, actually on a trip that I took with my parents right after my dad retired, the whole, the whole family went, they wanted to go to Nashville and Memphis was on the, way and we definitely were going to hit Graceland on the way to Nashville and uh yeah I tour I toured Graceland and what you described there you know I'd heard about the jungle room to be in the jungle room the house in some ways as you said has evolved because there's the museum and the other things that they've done that are around it it's a destination but parts of the house at the time I think his aunt was still living upstairs and so the tour yeah the family were, still celebrates Christmas every year at Graceland yeah so, so you know people it was, who are left sort of this weird thing and you know i was thinking when you mentioned the jungle room i was thinking about mark cone's song mm-hmm. which makes a reference to it and that's all you have to say is the jungle room and anybody 
of a certain age and a certain thing knows knows what you're talking about. I mean, it's you know, it's uh, and by the way, I think it was tacky even when it was current. You know, but th- but that's okay. That w- that was the nature of that. Yeah, the tackiness thing. was the point at that point. It had become right. sort of its own stylistic thing. Yeah. So, I, but I, I agree with you. I think it's going to be an interesting this thing to see. And this is not just a challenge. You, you mentioned, you know, I live in the Houston area. You know, for the longest period of time, people would come. We'd take them to NASA. That was the logical thing to do, right? I mean, it's here. So, or, you know, for a period of time, find something to do where they may be able to go see something in the Astrodome when that was still a thing, you know, when we, which, you know, we, we, we cover stadiums all the time now, but that was the first time we did it and, and did it the way we did it in style. So I, I, I am going to be watching that because I understand, you know, the economic impact of that. And to the point that you've already made, there's a rich, there's a rich heritage of, of music and other things that are there in Memphis that are, Elvis is just a part of that. If you really understand the blues and you really understand some other things about, you know, reasons to go, there's reasons to go other than uh, a converted church that somebody made into a mansion. <laughs> Yeah, so. that's a that's a good way of putting it. Um, you know, I think if I could, because actually while we were talking is I what I wish Grayson would become, I don't think there's any way that it's going to, at least for the time being, I would love it to be kind of like almost like the Ryman is in Nashville mm-hmm. or the Grand Ole Opry, where it's because they have a concert venue there already, but where it's turned into sort of a place to celebrate all of Memphis music using the backdrop of Elvis as sort of the natural, you know, location and sort of binding thread of the blues, country, rock and roll, gospel, all of that, but sort of turn it into a more broad-based, you know, performance yeah. venue and sort of expression of, of Memphis music, not just, oh, this is all about Elvis. I think that's, so they're going to have to do something like that in order to continue. I, th- I think that's a cool idea. And the you know, I I, I, other thing that popped into my head, just realizing here, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be the Elvis bump. I think that co- that's already come here from like the Golden Globe win. You know, the, one of the last mm-hmm. things you saw, there's a public appearance was because of the Elvis movie. And so they're going to be, you know, there's Elvis, we're in that Elvis, another boost of nostalgia phase here. This is a, as an event, a tragic event is still going to nudge that along a little bit, but you know, to the point five, 10 years from now, what nudges people to say, you know, let's, again, my parents, we were going to Nashville. We were going to stop in Memphis and time that, that, that trip out mm-hmm. in such a way we had time to do Graceland. That was, that was part of the itinerary. And that was, well, that was actually 30, 30 years ago, give or take now, you know, so that, that was going to be done. And uh, so I know that was part of it. Again, Dylan, I, I just want to say again, how excited we are to have you join the team and uh, looking forward to, uh, I know you've got, you've already made some topical suggestions. We're going to get some things done there. And uh, it's nice to have our in-house as we discovered, as we were doing some of the Eisenhower and some of the other episodes, you know, it's actually a good thing to have somebody with some legal training who's a lawyer on the podcast, because uh, I think you're one of the lawyers that Shakespeare wouldn't have wanted to kill Dylan. It's just <laughs> as simple as that. I think that might be the most complimentary thing anybody's ever said about my legal career. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Anything else you want to say say to me or say to the good folks? No, I just want to say uh, to everybody who's a, a frequent listener, uh, forgive me for any terrible jokes that I may tell from now until kingdom come. And uh, to everybody who's on the team and, and, you know, thanks for having me on. I look forward to being able to help out and have some fun. Sounds good. Dylan, have a great rest of your day. And uh, to our listeners, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash a fork in time or follow us on Twitter at A F I T podcast if you want to support the show financially visit our patreon page at patreon.com forward slash a fork in time we hope you will join us next time